All right. Well, here we go. Welcome back to the Grantwood Country Forum 2022. Thank you to our hosts, Cedar Rapids Public Library and our collaborating partners, the Anamosa Library and Learning Center, as well as Cedar Rapids Museum Art of Art and the Iowa Poetry Association. So how lucky are we? And um, I got to get out of my screen share just a minute uh, so that I can let some folks in. I'm doing a little double duty here. How about that? Uh, <laughs> so. So pardon that, but we will make it happen. Okay, there we go. Um, we've got two more. And welcome Terry and Ignacio. We've just started. So um, it's nice to have you among us. Uh, so yes, hats off to our um, hosts and partners and uh, who all help us together to make this lively. Um, and let's see here. And now I can't see my screen, so I've got to shut that off. Oh, you guys, stand by, stand by. I can't see my slides while I'm checking the chat, chat here. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Oh. Do, 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 do. There we go. There we go. All right. <laughs> we'll get to it. So, yes, officially the name of this series is Friendships for Words and Art, a journey into the life and legacy of Grant Wood and the land and people of Grant Wood country. And it is for anyone interested in the art, culture, and history of this area and the artists known as Grant Wood, as well as those who may also have an interest in being inspired and writing in response to what we experience together. And of course, today is Valentine's Day and I would like everyone to see this Valentine from our Steve Hankin, Man About the Cemetery. Steve, will you tell us a little bit about your Valentine? I'm not going to own Aww. this whole thing. <laughs> it's one of those things that I just dig up as I go <laughs> along. Um, <laughs> I go, I've go. i probably been in close to 3,000 cemeteries. Wow. And this is the kinds of things that I look for. Wow. Especially... Isn't that just especially odd names and things like that. To find somebody buried in a cemetery whose last name is Anks was a real kicker. But I find <laughs> lots, of, lots of strange and things out there. I bet. And, uh, but isn't this just, a, isn't this just kind of neat? I mean, we're, we're diving back into history and I, I love that you found this and you sh um, shared this with me so I could share it with everyone. That, that's a lot of fun, Steve, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, all right, let's keep going. And I wanted to just kind of give a recap for everybody, kind of where we're at now, where we've been, where we're going. Um, last week, uh, we, had Sean Ulmer here with the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art and giving us a wonderful uh, presentation related to Grant Wood's evolution in style, as well as Don Terpstra of the Iowa Poetry Association uh, speaking to us about ekphrastic poetry and writing. And, and by the way, of course, you can, you can see these on the Cedar Rapids Public Library's YouTube channel if you'd like to revisit these. And I highly encourage you to because they're so rich. It's just kind of hard to absorb these pr presentations in just one, you know, one viewing. Um, there's, just, there's just so much. There's a reason we can do a 10-week session springboarding off of Grant Wood because there's just a lot. Um, uh, the session before that, we heard from Steve Hankin and all his evocative information he gave us about the rich uh, history of Iowa's land and, and early peoples. Uh, it was wonderful. So that's captured in the YouTube uh, channel as well. And of course, our very first session was an overview of 
the forum. We introduced ourselves to each other and we um, enjoyed hearing about the Grant Wood collect, permanent collection and how that all came to be from curator uh, Kate Canal at the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art. She kicked off our series in just great style. So that's where we've, we've been. And um, so just a few more announcements here. I already mentioned the YouTube channel for session rec recordings. Feel free to use the chat function here to exchange you know, comments and email addresses and contact information. If you wanna do that privately with each other, you can do that. If you wanna make comments, I'm, um, I'll do the best I can to kind of monitor after um, uh, Barbara and Terry get going. I'll be monitoring the chat more closely than I can right now. Um, I'm hoping there's not too many people trying to get in. No, they're not at this point. So I can't quite monitor right now, but I'll, I'll get back to it. Um, and by the way, we, we have determined that last year's inaugural forum that was held in, uh, with the Anamosa Library and Learning Center, those will be available on the, on the uh, YouTube channel as well. Um, as well as our inaugural ending project publication known as the Grantwood Country Chronicle. And that will also be made available via the Cedar Rapids Public Library in digital upload format and for viewing if you do go to the library. So bravo to them for taking that on and making, so the full history of this forum is going to be captured and uh, integrated into the public library system for all to know and enjoy. So I couldn't be more tickled about that. Um, let me see if we have somebody waiting. I need to live in, uh, let in, no, I don't. Okay. Um, all right, feel, um, so yes, I, I really, really wanna uh, say something before our next session, which is a reading session, which could sound intimidating, but it really, doesn't have to be. Um, this is not a high stakes reading session on the 28th. This is for us to enjoy each other. Um, we're not, this is not a juried thing. This is not a workshopping session. This is merely, did you think of something to write a poem? Did you write a piece of short fiction that you were inspired by once you rolled around in some of our presentations? Um, just what came to you, or you could share, hey, I was inspired to start, you know, researching something that I didn't even think of before this. You know, the reading session is a lot about presenting our creativity, but also our inspirations and responding to each other with support and encouragement. And so we will have a couple more opportunities to do that throughout this session as well. And, um, and so that'll give you a chance to kind of roll around in, um, in, in the process of reading and presenting, you know, Grant Wood Country inspired uh, content to a group before you may want to uh, consider submitting things to our end project. By the time we get to the end of the forum, you'll probably have plenty uh, of inspiration to go ahead and, and submit. So to us for inclusion. So we have a nice, I'm really hoping we have another wonderful um, documentation of our experience here together and what it kind of sparked in us. Um, Cause I think it's, a, it's, it's fairly, um, it's, it's such a lovely thing that, that all of you are here together continuing to learn and um, be inspired by, by our presenters and uh, this area and the artist Grant Wood. Um, you can always email me. So there's my email address. Don't, don't hesitate. Um, a reminder that there's writing resources and links included in the most recent re email from Cedar Rapids Public Library to everybody. Um, so feel, and you know, you can go down the rabbit hole too online too. You, you can get lots of advice out there from lots of people. Uh, about different genres and ways to write. I uh, simply wanted to capture some things that might um, springboard you um, and give you some, some uh, confidence if, if you feel you're lacking that. Because again, I can't say this strongly enough. 
We're not here to judge your craft. We're here to share our inspirations. And if you want things, you know, if you're worried about your crafting of things, we can talk about that privately. And there's plenty of people we can get you comfortable mm -hmm. with what you're inspired to write if you're able to hear about that. Um, writing resources and links, yes. And um, I did wanna mention, I'm not sure I mentioned it at a previous session, that rhyming dictionaries are a wonderful thing to have around. And when it comes to trying your hand at poetry, I personally like The Book of Forms by Lewis Turco, but we have some other poets here and they might have some suggestions. So we'll have to look at the chat for that too. If there's people who have things that they find particularly helpful when they're crafting writing of any genre, fiction, nonfiction, um, please feel free to share. And um, as far as the submission formatting requirements for our end product from these sessions, uh, those formatting um, requirements are coming very soon. I had a chance to chat with um, uh, Meredith uh, at length this week about the ins and outs on the production side of making this all happen. So I'm just tickled because we're, we're making it happen. And you'll find out soon enough, whether it's 12 point times Roman or times new Roman or six <laughs> space and you know, mm -hmm. what, what we, what we got to do to make this all happen. <laughs> um, okay. Oh yeah. And um, just, I wanted to capture some of these dates because uh, I'm hoping that, that uh, you'll be able to engage some of, some of the things that are happening on these dates and bring friends and that sort of thing. Uh, kind of, we've dedicated a day to visit the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art and the studio on Saturday, April 9th. Um, and of course, there's other things to visit in Cedar Rapids as well that we that folks could, if they traveled in from out of town. Um, the, on Monday, March 14th, uh, the submission period will open for those of you inspired to have something published at, in our end, end product here. And, um, and then we'll close that on midnight Sunday of May 1st. And, and again, this is, you know, you guys are it. You're the creators of this end product. This is not, we're shipping in some, some, some you know, people, who've been writing for three decades and won every prize under the book and they're going to be judging you. No, this is us just doing our best to offer an authentic snapshot of this area and what we've come to know. Um, Sunday, August 18th, um, I'm hoping we could create a lot of buzz to enjoy the rooftop at the Cedar Rapids Public Library and gather and celebrate when that um, uh, publication will actually uh, roll out that day, people in this forum will uh, be receiving their complimentary copy of the end pro of our end project. And there's going to be, we're working right now to put together just a lively experience in the spirit, in the spirit of the, the old art colony days on Sundays. So, be prepared for some some pleasant surprises on that, and we'll and we'll be tapping you for your ideas as well as as things to do on that on that Sunday in August. And that is the wrong date. I apologize. It's the twenty eighth, Sunday, August twenty eighth. Do you hear that recording? That was a typo. <laughs> oh, you know, I I spell names wrong. I put anyway. Um, and now, and now possibly for the moment we're truly re uh, waiting for is uh, the stained glass wonder tonight with, um, with uh, Barbara Feller and Terry Van Dorsten. And I do want to introduce Barbara. Um, and then Barbara, if you and Terry would like to, if you would like to tell us something about Terry or Terry, you tell us a little bit more about yourself when it's time. Uh, we'd love to hear a little bit more about um, uh, your your background and interest in this in this uh, window. Yeah, you betcha. Oh, thank you, thank you. So, presenter Barbara Feller was born in the Bronx and raised in upstate New York. 
and author Barbara Feller fell in love with Iowa and Iowans while working as an educator in area schools and museums. Barbara retired from her museum venue in 2013 with a desire to share inspiring stories of the history of her adopted community. Since that time, she's authored two books, Road to Wabique, Discovering J.G. Sigmund, and Creation of an Artist, Grant Wood's Boyhood Story. She is currently working on a third book, Window Through Time, about the memorial window, which Grant Wood designed for Cedar Rapids Veterans Memorial Building. Information about all three of her books can be found at icecubepress.com. Welcome, Barbara and Terry. And please share your screen whenever you like. I'll it says I can't do it. I'll yet. stop it. Yep. Okay. I've, I've got to do two buttons here to stop share. There we go. Thank you very much. Well, Barb's getting that set up. I'll introduce myself really quickly. I'm Terry Van Dorsten, been the museum manager at the Veterans Memorial Commission Museum for the past nine years. Prior to that, I was at the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art and I was their registrar for about nine and a half years. So I've been around, feels, feels like I'm a local now. <laughs> Terry and I met while we were both working at the Museum of Art, and uh, we are so glad to be re reconnected with this special project. And uh, we also want to introduce a very special guest appearance that will happen in a short while, and this is Debbie Bilstein. Debbie, could you say hello to people so they can see you if they're sure. checking out? speakers. I'm Debbie Bilstein and I have a family connection to Grant Wood. His eldest brother Frank was married to my grandmother's sister, my great aunt. So he was my great uncle and um, I knew Frank and his sister Nan Wood Graham very well. So kind of grew up with Grant Wood kind of being in the background whenever we were all together as a family. So I'm honored to be here this evening and every night. Whoops, there's somebody's dog, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so you, So nice Debbie. to meet you all. It's wonderful to see all of you and, um, and we're pretty excited to, we love Grant Wood, so it's kind of exciting to have him on Valentine's Day and the day after his 131st birthday, I suppose, or the, at least he was born 131 years ago yesterday. If you have, we're going to, um, we're going to be talking about the memorial window. And if you were able to hear that fabulous talk last week by Sean Ulmer, you will know that this was one of the steps, and I believe one of the most important steps, that Grant Wood took in, in becoming what we would call his mature um, style. Uh, they don't want to say he had a regionalist style, because as you will recall, regionalist is not a really a style, it just means that people were highlighting the area that they come from, and he did do that uh, a lot through working on this memorial window, but we're going to be uh, stressing more in this case um, the actual work that was done and how it came to be that Grant Wood got this commission. And so a lot of what we're going to hear is going to be a kind of a different view from the artist's view, more of an historic view, and Terry is absolutely the most perfect person. I couldn't ask for a better partner and uh, I am really, really happy to have you, Terry. Um, if you have any questions, we would appreciate it if you would kind of put them in the chat so that we will continue and then we will um, try to take time to answer the questions at the end. Okay, Terry, I'm turning it over to you. All right, thanks, Barb. And it's so true. Barb and I have really had a blast putting this presentation together. It's mutual. 
Brant would love here for sure. And we really hope that it delights and inspires your own thoughts and writing. We have a lot of information to get through tonight. We have a ton of visuals and like Barb, like Barb said, um, the historic base behind this monumental glass. So <laughs> without further ado, we're gonna get through quickly, I hope. Um, Grant would talk about his World War I experience and how his service in the military made it so meaningful that he got the contract for the memorial window work and so on and so forth. So are you ready? <laughs> Is everyone ready? All right, let's go. Slide, please. So I want to begin by explaining how did Grant Wood get the Memorial Window Project. For presentation purposes tonight, we're gonna to meet up with the artist at this time, 1918, when he was in his late 20s, just as he had volunteered to serve in the army very near the end of World War I. You can slide in, Barb. This is a copy of his draft card from Camp Dodge in Des Moines. During this time, Wood also visited and sketched these fellows at the Mound Farm, Farm Camp. The Mound Farm, in this instance, was a transition military post for Battery E soldiers of Cedar Rapids. And since this might be new sketches for our group, I wanted to highlight some cropped details that I cropped down of the sketches featuring local military men. And I think the captions really capture Grant Wood's humor and cheekiness, especially this one on the right, where he's poking fun at Private Kasner for being left-handed. So he has a special way of holding his pens. So here, sorry, I skipped. Is that okay? Yeah, I just need to get. All right, pardon me. So by the dates and information from that draft card that we saw, um, I dug into it and it appears that Grant Wood served in World War I for a total of four and a half months in the army. Here's a likely timeline. After basic training at Camp Dodge in Des Moines, his orders were given or his job, right, was to camouflage artillery. This visual image does not contain Grant Wood, so if you're searching for his face, he is not there, but I did want to give you the visual of fellow soldiers in the same regiment on American University campus camouflaging military items, which in this instance would be screens that would camouflage the tanks overseas. Thankfully, the war ended and Grant Wood was able to go home before he was shipped overseas. However, from a war standpoint and for this presentation, I think it's important to note that Grant Wood would have encountered many battle-edged combat soldiers returning home at the end of that absolutely brutal world war. But here is our soldier again. Oh, can you go back please, Barb? Oh. All right. Thank you. Here's our soldier again. The service portrait as it appears in the Lynn County Honor Roll that highlights nearly a thousand local service white men and a couple pages of service women nurses. We have four original <coughs> copies of that I, volume. I thought in the, we had a picture of that. That's why I went down. That's okay, right. So, yeah. We have four, four copies of this entire volume in the collection. And now we can fast forward, Barb, thank you, to the <laughs> Roaring Twenties, 1925 in Cedar Rapids. Grant Wood, I'm sorry, Grant Wood, <laughs> Cedar Rapids at this time in 1925, it was, and it still really is a very patriotic city. In 1925, Cedar Rapids was eager to expand and create a draw, a magnet, if you will, for Northeastern Iowa. What you're seeing here are political cartoons in favor of the vote to build a memorial hall in Cedar Rapids on an island in the Cedar River. It did get a bit political because the vote 
was a yes or a no for the good people of Cedar Rapids to pay a property tax levy to help fund the structure even to this day. So Cedar Rapids did it, they went big or they went home. They wanted to create a Veterans Memorial, City Hall, Central Civic Center, and the Chamber of Commerce. Modern day, this reminder and pledge card would have been a Facebook event to put on your Google calendar and everybody is encouraged to run to the polls to vote yes. Slide please. And the community did vote yes to this property tax levy in support of the memorial building work. And it's really important to mention here that it was the Civil War, Spanish-American War, and World War I veterans and their auxiliaries who rallied the community to build this massive endeavor. And again, you can see by this aerial view in the 60s, it really is massive. And here's what the building looks like today. Snow and all, everyone. So along with the Civil War, Spanish-American War, veteran associations, the World War I veterans, including Grant Wood, was slated to have a, an office in the Memorial Building for their veteran service organization, the American Legion. And that's when in comes Grant Wood, if you will, who happened to be an up and coming local Midwest painter and decorative artist. And he was also this World War I veteran and was a member of the American Legion post Hanford number five. Slide please. So I'm driving home with a detail of one of their parade flags that's also in the museum collection that this the Legion is a powerful, influential, and civic-minded service organization. And Grant Wood's post, Hanford number five, was one of the it's largest in Iowa for I'm many sorry. years. I, I'm so Barb, can you slide, please? Thank you. So alongside Grant Wood here is an image of the Legion from our archives. It's the Veterans Ready for Memorial Day Parade in 1943. Grant Wood is not present, but I just thought this was a great visual of what the Legionnaires looked like and were doing, and this would have been how old he would have looked had he, had he lived. So we speculate. Yeah, just, I'm sorry, I would just like to have anybody who's not speaking, please oh. mute, because that is... Uh, that is a distraction when I'm hearing those sounds. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, thanks, Barb. So Grant Wood has firsthand knowledge of the memorial art piece and the funding available at the memorial building because he's a legionnaire. Grant Wood pitches his desire to win the project by writing a letter addressed to the local building architect who in turn presents it to the commission. And this is a digital copy of the transcribed letter that Grant Wood wrote on December 12th, 1926. He wrote the letter and then it was read on public record. You can see the date up in the left there, January 25th, 1927 at the meeting. Debbie Feilstein, will you do us the honor of reading Grant Wood's letter, please? Absolutely. Thank you. Dear Mr. Brown, I wish very much, as you know, to get the contract for the stained glass window in Memorial Coliseum. I can give you no higher recommendation than that Mr. Hornbostel feels that I am capable of doing it to the credit of both the building and myself. I might mention that I am both a legion and a local man, but I feel that in only one way have any bearing on the matter. I am public spirited enough to wish the city to get the very best it can in the way of a memorial building, local or outside. But I feel very sure that no outside man could put into the window 
the work and devotion that I myself would. I am fortunate in having a friend, Mr. Alfred E. Flogo of New York. He is a winner of the American Prix de Rome, perhaps the highest honor that this country gives to a young artist. His specialty is stained glass. And since he has returned to this country, he has been recognized as a leader in this field. I was with him a great deal when he was studying old glass, both in Italy and France. He writes me that he will give me his most enthusiastic cooperation should I require it. I do not want to seem to push the matter, but I would like to point out that the window, as planned, will take a great amount of research and detail work and will take, at the very least, a full year's time. A painted glass window seems required rather than the ordinary mosaic effect with bits of translucent glass. This will look much better from the outside by day. I would do the painting on the glass myself and the paint would be fused into the glass by heat at the factory where the window is put together. This process is, of course, as permanent as the other, but requires more time. Hoping that I may hear favorably from you and the commission, I am sincerely yours, Grant Wood. So Mr. Smith moves, seconded by Mr. Beeler, that the contract for the memorial window be awarded to Grant Wood, providing it shall cost no more than $9,000, and providing further that Mr. Wood shall submit sketches for the approval of the commission. The motion carried, all present voting, aye. And that very evening, a local paper reports that Grant Wood was rewarded the contract. Slide, please. Three months after that, the contract is drawn up and signed, as you can see here. Slide. And two days after that contract is signed, Grant Wood is off to New York City to begin his research and preparatory work on it. So we have information based on a sketchbook that Grant Wood took with him on his trip to New York. And this gives us some indication of what he did during his research. This sketchbook, the original, is at the Figgy Museum right now in Davenport, but um, they have allowed us, thankfully, to have digitized uh, photographs of some of the pages or all of the pages, but we're not showing you all the pages. <laughs> this is his final page where he is showing kind of a sketch of what he hopes the window will look like. And on several of the pages when I was looking through, and Terry also, um, we discovered some perhaps sources. Now this one, Terry found, and you can tell me what you think. Uh, Terry, Tell them what this is. I mean, it says what it is, but where did you find it? Right. I, I, this is just in the past month. I was going through the digital copy of the sketchbook and at the top of his sketch for the American Revolutionary Soldier, it says, and I quote, uniforms of the armies in the war of the American Revolution. And I just Googled that very, I put it in quotes and I Googled it and this popped up. Here's the page. You tell me if you think he was using <laughs> this a picture when he drew this sketch for yeah, his this, model. Yes, this dance and how he's pushing, the soldier is pushing forward and he's grasping the rifle and Grant Wood even goes so far as to draw in the colors on his black and white sketchbook pretty much to the um, drawing that Lefferts drew. It's just it's uncanny, it's super fun. Here's something that I came across doing a similar thing to what Terry did. He just wrote in the name Townsend, page 153 on one of his pages. And so I also Googled and I found that there is a set of scrapbooks by Grosmer, Grosner L. Townsend. And uh, this is in the collection, um, at um, uh, the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And it has uh, documents 
letters and photographs of people in um, the Spanish-American War. Terry, I'm handing it back to you. All right. So it was in the spring of 1927 now that Grant Wood would have returned from New York City. We know he presented a picture of the design to the commission. I'm doing that because it was quoted picture in their January 1928th monthly meeting. So what did he do for the months during spring 1927 and the 1928 January meeting new year when he was making this picture? He was, Grant Wood was making, what I'm trying to get at is Grant Wood was making a one for one drawing of the window. Okay. Getting back to my notes, bear with me here. <laughs> so by our, okay, yes, by our calculations, it was the spring of 1927. Um, can you back up to the three? Thank you. I want to, I want to make note um, what happened from 1970 to, all oh, right. to 2021 with these drawings, because it's such uh, new news for Grant Wood enthusiasts. Um, so first of all, I really need to give a big shout out and thank you to the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art. Check this out. Um, in 1973, the Grant Wood one for one drawings, which by the way, the stained glass artisans call cartoons. So if you hear me saying cartoons, I'm referring to these drawings. In the 1970s, all the drawings, all 58 of them, were found stuffed into the steam pipes of the Veterans Memorial Building in one of our underground storage spaces. This was in 1973. The facility manager who was brought these drawings knew what they were, and he called the then art museum director on the phone and said, you won't believe what we found. Can you please house them? We don't have a proper facility to take care of these original Grant Wood drawings. And thankfully the art museum director said yes. And from 1973 until 2021, they were at the art museum. So thank you, art museum. I retrieved them in, gosh, what was it, Barb, June or July of 21. Why? And I closed the loan so that now I have a climate, control, climate controlled storage room, drawers dedicated to the drawings. So mm. historians and myself can compare them to the window and we're slated to get them conserved as well. And I was lucky enough to have made an appointment to talk to Terry about the window at the very time that these arrived. So I was there when she first opened them. It was very thrilling. I was gleeful, dare I say, gleeful. Very. All right, so back in time, we are with the World War I soldier cartoon, and I wanted to present to the forum the drawing next to the finished stained glass panels. And we know who the model was for it. Barbara, if you do the slide. Thank you. His name is Ronald Sears. Ronald Sears, shown here in his World War I uniform, was from 1927. Grant Wood knew him as a World War I veteran, and Mr. Sears also worked for the Public Works Department for the city of Cedar Rapids. Slide, please. So let's take a closer look at all three phases. The model in the center, the drawing, and the finished glass. When I came across Sears' portrait in the Veterans Memorial Museum archives, I instantly spotted the like, likeliness, the likeness to the drawing. I mean, he's just a ringer. And I hope you can see that too. All right, let's dive deeper into Grant Wood's process and consider that he was a World War I veteran himself. So here we have the artist and his model. Slide please. In a page from the Memorial Window scrapbook, 
illustrating that Grant Wood worked out the hand position, the hands that cover the rifle. Against an image of a classic doughboy from World War I. All against a detail of the finished memorial soldier in glass. And here you can really see the difference of what translated and what didn't from drawing to glass. Mostly the rounded features were very, very difficult for Grant Wood to get onto glass because each section, as you can see, is, is divided up with these uh, lead uh, strips that made it so that he kind of had to straighten everything, make it less curvy, shall we say, and a little bit more formal. Thanks, Barb. So now let's go on to the American Revolutionary Soldier of 1776. Again, here we have the drawing next to the finished glass piece. And here is our model. <laughs> Perfect Robert, just after our game, right? Yes, Robert S. Evans. And he was the star quarterback in the 1926-1927 Washington High School football team. It's a big deal. It was a big deal back then because the team was the Iowa State champions that year. So Evans' family shared Robert's story with Barb and I, and we'll give a special thanks to Robert's nephew, local artist and also Vietnam veteran. It's Bob Peterson, who's a docent at the art museum. Slide, please. You see, Robert Evans was also a student at McKinley School in Grantwood's art class. This image was taken as the students were painting Imagination Isle Freeze. If you recognize it, it was the same mural that Sean Ulmer had highlighted last week. You can also see the frieze tacked up against the back and it's wrapping around the tables for the art class. The yellow arrow here points to a student identified by Evans family as Robert Evans. He was also in, we're gonna fast forward to his Washington high school times, Robert's times. He was in the high Y club and that was capital H, lowercase i, capital Y, High Y Club at Washington High School. And it was interesting company that this club kept, including John B. Turner II, Arnold Pyle, and a gentleman named Jerome Kriz. Jerome Kriz is kind of uh, my additional uh, discovery. And I'm going to be telling you or asking you also a little bit. You may notice, you may have noticed that uh, on the, on the window, there is one soldier who is dressed in a different style uniform altogether. We'll point him out a little bit later, but look for the one in the red pom-pom hat and wearing no shirt whatsoever. Um, this has been a mystery and we are well aware of it. And uh, we have been doing a lot of discovering and he happens to be the grandfather of a friend of mine the model. And um, we're going to ask you also to think about if you know anything about any of the models, please let us know. But this picture, as, as Terry said, includes this club included um, the son, the son of, um, well, the grandson of John B. Turner in the pioneer picture. And his uh, father was the uh, the son of John B. Turner, and he was uh, a great uh, uh, sponsor for Grant Wood. The organization, the High Y Club, was, called, was founded in 1919 to create leadership and maintain by persistence an uh, and extend service in this age of misunderstood youth. I thought that kind of was an interesting description. Indeed. All right, I'm going back to you, Terry. Oh, thanks. Can you bring up the slide with the sketchbook as well? Oh, yes. Thank you. So back to the sketches and drawings. Here's a series of images to show how meticulous Grant Wood was with the project. He's using the illustration by Leffert to sketch the soldier uniform 
and includes the colors in the sketchbook, to finding a local model to fit his vision, to draw up the likeliness to scale on the window cartoon. Whew. All right, so our third model we're going to discuss is the Lady of Peace. She is 22 feet tall and has been referred to as the Lady of Peace. She's also been referred to as the Republic or America. And in one article, she's called the heroic central figure. We might also tell you that you might know her by a different name and that would be <laughs> Nan Wood, Grant Wood's sister. And here's a quote that I found uh, that she is describing coming to be the model for this paint, this stained glass. He considered several ideas for the window before fixing upon the one he would use. At the base would be the life-size figures of soldiers of every American war, the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Mexican War, the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, and World War I, known at that time simply as the World War. Above the soldiers would be the central figure, a woman representing the Republic. Although he said my features were all wrong, he decided to use me for the woman model. He would paint a classical face rather than mine. My costume was a problem too. He wanted graceful draperies and tried an old sheet, but it was too stiff. After more experimentation, he tried cotton jersey and learned that putting it on me wet would do the trick. The weather was chilly and he worried that I could catch cold, so he turned up the heat. Grant really sweated over that drawing. And the wreath I held was so heavy a prop that he made me, um, was so heavy that he made a prop so I could rest my arm. And here's a sketch from that sketchbook. And you can see she's also holding a palm. Yes, and the palm is referred to as the palm branch of peace. And there's the wreath. Yes, the wreath that she <laughs> says was so heavy that he had to give her something to rest her arm upon. Look at this beautiful man wood. This is just such a gorgeous flapper picture, I would say. This is from 1922, which was before he did this drawing. But, but here she is in... Uh, just held held to us, I think. Yeah, in the I look at her in the twenties. And here she is again. This is later in the forties. And uh, Terry had a good reason for showing this. You want to explain that? Oh, thanks. I wanted to show this one. It because it really I feel it really shows Nan's um, the cheeks and the shadow lines on. A very stunning picture of her opposed against, juxtaposed against the painting lines in the glass. And I should mention that these are the two pictures of Nan were from the digitized Figgy scrapbooks. And here we have uh, Grant Wood at work with his assistant, Arnold Pyle, who was one of the members of that high Y club that was, uh, that we showed you the photographs of. And here they are, these drawings, these cartoons were so large that uh, they, they ended up going to um, Quaker Oats Recreation Room and, um, and putting up these drawings. And you can see from the title of this article in the, in the Cedar Rapids Gazette that semi-acrobatic stunts required <laughs> in designing the big memorial window. And while they are wearing their shirts and ties, which were de rigor for the day, uh, this is also the place where Grant Wood decided he wanted to start wearing overalls. He wanted to match up with the workers who were there. Did you have any other things you wanted to say about this? I do. If you can, well, I'll go back to the nuts and bolts a little bit of Grant Wood presenting this contract to the memorial commissioners. It's a safe assumption also at this point that there were other prominent parties such as the mayor, legionnaires, Colonel Robbins, Colonel Beeler that we showed you to give the final approval for the design. And that's all I wanted to say, Barb. 
All right. Thank you. So after the commissioners did approve the large scale <coughs> mock-up. <coughs> oh, sorry, I thought someone was talking. Okay, sorry. Um, Grantwood chooses the email fry stained glass artisans in St. Louis to fabricate the glass. And I'm saying chooses because I'm pretty sure that's how it went. I'm still doing research on exactly how he came about using email fry artisans in St. Louis. Um, what, did it go out for city bid or because he got the contract for a lump sum of $9,000 did he have right or carte blanche right to pick the artisans? I'm still doing research on that. So at any rate, he takes the portfolio of the 58 drawings to St. Louis where he learns from Emil Fry Sr. that there is an artisan overflow branch in Munich, Germany where the Fries had immigrated from. The shop in Germany, those artisans were paid to do Emil Fry's studio glass work. And at this pivotal point, Grant Wood and Emil Fry Jr. decide to go to Germany to fabricate the wooden, the window panels rather than have them fabricated by the artisans at St. Louis who could have John, done just the same amazing job. So this choice gives Grant Wood the opportunity to travel one more time to Europe, to Munich this time, to experience the culture and heritage of that old country? Well, people who know me will not be surprised to see this picture. You might notice it's behind me if you're looking at me uh, speaking. This is quilts that Grant Wood did in 1928. And this story relates to his very good friend and his name is J.G. Sigmund. And those of you who know me know that I was compulsive about finding out about Jay Sigmund and I was introduced to his daughter-in-law and while she was brewing some tea for me I happened to just see this painting on her wall. It wasn't in a famous museum or anything. It was just there signed Grant Wood 1928 Wabeek, Iowa. Wabeek is a small town of population 87 that uh, that was the birthplace of Jay Sigmund and he had a, a home that he would go to with his family and Grant Wood visited him there at the time that he had just decided he's going back to Europe one more time. Grant Wood had just had, um, it just I don't say just, in 1926, he'd had an exhibition in Paris which he'd hoped would bring him some fame. Even though the Pope himself asked to see more of these paintings of Grant Wood. Grant was not at all pleased with the result of that and just thought, I can't do this kind of style. At that time, he thought everybody who wants to be an artist should be an impressionist. They should follow the French painters, et cetera, et cetera. Otherwise they weren't really an artist. And Jay Sigmund walks along the Wapsipinikin River with him while he's talking about this and he's saying, you are going to Europe one more time. What I want you to do when you're there is take a look, see how you can find Iowa there because Iowa is what you know. And this is supposed to be the first step that Grant Wood takes in really becoming a regionalist painter. And it also is a first step toward uh, changing his style from that impressionist and as uh, Jay Sigmund's daughter-in-law explained to me, she could see the difference in the style of his brush strokes in this very first painting. So here we are in Munich, Germany, and I will turn this back over to Terry now. Thanks, I love that story about the quilts. So yeah, thanks, he is in Germany, and aren't we glad that he went to Germany? So these artisans helped create a lasting treasure for Cedar Rapids and the veterans of all wars. Also, while he was in Germany, he immersed himself in the culture and the arts, museums, and the countryside. Do you want to point out in this? Oh, can you go back? Thank yeah, you. Sorry. That the drawing for the American Revolutionary Soldier and a smidge look at the War of 1812 Cannoneer 
is behind the German artisans. Can you all see that? Great. All right, now slide, Barb. Here are two images of works that Grant Wood created in Germany in his impressionistic style. Notice the Gothic architecture, the church in the marketplace Nuremberg painting. Grant Wood also took to museums. Oh, sorry. Grant Wood also took to the museums. And historians point out in particular, he would have seen the Dürer exhibition that was at the Alte Pinnehoek during his three month stay there. He would have come in contact with one of Dürer's self portraits, like the one. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. Um, anyway, taking in and connecting with works like this uh, realistic self portrait with the background of Dürer's native landscape. All this certainly would bring a young Grant Wood to render his own self-portrait that we'll see in a, in a, in a little bit. Okay, back to you, Barb. <laughs> All right, before we get to him, we go back to Chase Sigmund and his, uh, in, in his telling, telling uh, Grant Wood to try to think of Iowa. Now we know, especially um, at this museum, you know, uh, there were a lot of things going on while Grant Wood was working on the on the stained glass with these artisans. They were fabulous, but they were used to being uh, working in churches. And uh, so there are stories that there were many, many delays. And he finally was teaching himself how to paint the glass because uh, when they were transferring the faces that he had drawn on these cartoons, they were turning them into what he thought looked like saints. He said one of them even looked like Jesus Christ himself. <laughs> and he couldn't help it. I mean, these people had been used to working on stained glass in uh, churches. But Grant Wood wanted Iowa to show up in his stained glass window. So uh, while he's taking some time away during these all these delays, he goes to the museums. And one of the other painters that he really mentions and Sean Ulmer mentioned is Hans Memling. And here is a portrait that Hans Memling did that Grant Wood may have seen. And thinking of Iowa, he thinks of his mother, Hattie Wood. And when he returns, which will be, you know, later, but I just want to show you this, he paints Woman with Plants. And I am sure, and I think you can probably see enough to agree with me that he was inspired by these paintings. Absolutely. And we'll go back to Terry now. Here is a self-portrait that he made in 1932, gazing out at the viewer with his native Iowa landscape in the background, windmill and all. Slide please. So when Grant Wood returned to install the window, by our calculations, he was there September, October, November of 1928. He returned in late November, December. It dawned on me during this very cold winter snap that we're all having that he was installing the window December and January, December 1928, January 1929. And I just can't imagine but they did it, they installed the memorial window. And to be clear, this process would look like Grant Wood on site with the St. Louis email fry glass artisans and local iron and steel workers all had to work together to put it in the art space. So to animate our timeline, I popped up this Christmas card greeting from Emil Frey, I suspect Emil Frey Sr., who was in Germany, this is postmarked in Munich, 18th of December, 1928, addressed to Grant Wood in his home at Five Turner Alley. Historians have also shared that when Grant Wood returned, he returned to a rather angry Cedar Rapids crowd as a scuttlebutt of sorts had been made against Grant Wood's travel to Germany of whom the world, right, had recently fought against. 
next slide, please. Thanks, Barb. It's further interesting to me that right around this time, the Memorial Building, this is a program from our archives, had a grand opening to tour the whole building on January 1st, 1929, New Year's Day. However, it's curious to me that the Memorial Window was not mentioned as part of the tour. Slide, please. Nor was the window dedicated after mention of its completion as published in this Gazette article on the 21st of February, 1929. Slide, please. So reflecting on that time, 1921, 1929, a season or so away from the Wall Street crash, a season or so away from the Great Depression, He's surrounded by veteran service organizations cheering on this Memorial Hall build. Organizations that included the powerful national Daughters of Revolution chapters, where locally they were known as the D.A.R. Ashley and the Mayflower chapter. The D.A.R. is said to have made such a stink in 1928-29 that the window was not dedicated as Wood would have preferred. It felt unfinished with no inscription engraved. There was no inscription engraved into it, into this open-ended pentagon. It's this shaped limestone. And I just can imagine how weird it must have looked blank at the base of the window. Here's a description by Wanda Korn of this situation. She says in her book, Regionalist Vision, that in 1932, many teacups were raised, trees planted, lectures given, and colonial balls danced in honor of the bicentennial of George Washington's birth. Though the 45th Congress had deemed George Washington's birthday February 22nd an historic date worthy of holiday recognition, 1932 was a special year. That time was George Washington's bicentennial commission. They'd been at work for six years, arranged international celebrations, put Washington's bust on two stamps, and saw to it that the rep reproduction of Gilbert Stewart's portrait of the first president were distributed to classrooms across the country. Celebrations were held everywhere. The ones in Cedar Rapids were typical of those held in towns and cities across the country. The local chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution some 170 members strong, held a birthday party for George Washington at the Hotel Montrose. It was a tradition with the daughters to hold colonial teas on Washington's birthday. They began each meeting with four minute talks on George Washington. For example, Washington the Christian, Washington the leader of men. And as part of their national program, they planted George Washington Memorial Elm on Island Plaza, not far from the building where Wood had installed his memorial window. With an appropriate ceremony, they placed a plaque on a tree bearing the D-A-R insignia. How did he react to that? <laughs> well, to drive home the scuttlebutt and bear with us here, um, here's a copy of the Daughters of Revolution sketch that Grant Wood did in 1932. The sketch is part of the Coe College collection, everyone. And personally, I can hear it. I can hear the anger in these halls filled with veterans saying, how dare he, and I'm ad-libbing here, how dare he use taxpayer money for a public art piece crafted by Germans in our new and grand Veterans Memorial building. I can honestly practically hear it in the halls. And I love saying that when I give the tours. Slide, please. So as Barb read, it, it really made that painting, the Daughters of Revolution in 1932, a perfect storm. He really poked the bear with that painting, jabbing back at the non-dedicated memorial. The DAR, like we said, is a nationwide influential, politically charged organiza organization. And I suspect Cedar Rapids could find likeliness or know exactly who those ladies were in the painting. Slide, please. And here it is, Grant Wood's answer 
to the DAR. George Washington, I love this teacup, the tea parties they were having. Crossing the Delaware by German artist Emanuel Lutz is in the background. The hook for a hand holding this teacup is Frances Prescott. Many of you will recognize her name as being the principal at one of the schools he worked at. And it really, it looks like a crow foot or it's very bird-like. And I'm pretty sure the brooch was purchased for Hattie's mother when Grant Wood was in Germany. And that's also a German lace collar standing out on the daughter on the right. And uh, I, have, I have to say using Grant Wood's sense of humor when he asked Mrs. Prescott to pose for this. He said, I needed the perfect hand and you always told me if I ever need a hand with my paintings, you were willing to be there <laughs> for me. And here's a close up uh, of the Washington crossing the Delaware, ironically by a German American artist who painted it in Germany using some of his students who were also international. So like we stated for this reason, the window was not officially dedicated, sadly until 1955, which was 13 years after Grant Wood's death. In 1955, this plaque was bolted to the limestone instead of a Bible verse that Grant Wood had recommended in 1929. Here is his sister Nan being featured in the, yep, the Cedar Rapids Gazette she was in attendance. Slide, please. So all of that said, all that said, the memorial window really does stand the test of time. We hope our presentation has outlined the importance of the contract for Grant Wood, both in that going to Germany in 1928 was an important step in Grant Wood's artistic journey. He researched each war of these soldiers meticulously to illustrate an authentic uniform. It's fun to note that the soldiers are in the uniform of the private, which is a low or the lowest rank in the military. Yet the private can be the backbone of each conflict, right? So Grant Wood gives the private in the military the honor here. They're memorialized and they're staring out at the viewer. They each have pursed lips gazing stare, stoic facial expressions, much like his masterpiece, masterpiece, excuse me, American Gothic. So in conclusion, conclusion, I want to mention that the more time, and I'm so fortunate to be able to see this window each day, the more time I agree with the historians who back the idea that it would have been a stretch for Grant Wood to arrive at the national masterpiece, American Gothic, if the artist had not taken the memorial window trip to Germany, where he meticulously worked those faces and hands of the soldiers himself. So if you take a, take a closer look. Thanks, Barb. Can you go back one slide, please? Thank you. Each, each soldier is holding something near and dear to them. It's their job. It is their livelihood. They're holding a weapon, a tool that represents the veteran in each war on display. Much like the finished American Gothic in 1930, where by the way, he is said to have won third place award causing a national sensation. Do we know who won the first place? We don't. I read recently in their frequently asked questions that no one remembers who won first place. <laughs> <laughs> and that concludes, unless you have something, Barb, our presentation on Thank the monumental glass. Much. Okay. All Thank right. You. I'm going to stop the share so that we can take a look at some of the um, questions that may have oh my. Okay. come up in the chat. It looks like there are quite a lot. All right, and uh, shall I hand it back over to you, Elaine? 
Well, fantastic. Oh my gosh. Guys, yeah. We had such a blast putting it together. I really hope. Oh, I it. can tell. It was, <laughs> it was just a labor of love, wasn't it? Oh yes, my it God. was. Oh, and, and Barb, I, I, I'm so tickled to know about Carrie's grandfather. Yes. 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 Oh my gosh. He's and the there. model for the shirtless uh, guy. And we're going to, you're going to have to read my book so you can find out more about that. <laughs> And so my book is not finished yet, so don't look for it yet, but let's just okay. see. Okay, so um, Terry, I see in the chat, I don't know if you can see in the chat that there was some, some discussion about the shirtless model and whether we know, is there anything definitive about, you, we know who he was, right? We now know, yeah, yeah, we now yeah. know who he was, and um, he was Carrie Chris's grandfather. And um, we also had some people doing research with Terry, and they came up with what I think is a very good theory that this is a cannoneer, a person who would have used the tool that's in his hand instead of a gun to put the cannons into the cannon. Uh, the cannonballs into the cannon, and he would have been working in a very hot area in the in a ship, and that's why he is dressed the way he is. And uh, there are further details that we will give you later. Okay, I will. If I can chime in and say that is the number one question I get every time I give a tour of the window: Why doesn't that guy have his shirt on? Um, and I also see in the chat that. Someone read that the American Revolutionary Soldier might be a self-portrait of Grant Wood and that Arnold Pyle might have been the model for the shirtless cannoneer. Um, and what are my thoughts on this? I think that was an interesting take on what may have been, but with these models coming or the relatives of these models coming forward and the research that we're doing, I would not say that was true. I would say that this is Ronald Evans and Jerome Kriz. Football players, Jerome Kriz yeah. was the captain of the football team and was also in the Highway Club and also in Grant Wood's art class. So, And another person we're um, looking into was mentioned by Nan Wood herself. And uh, that person I found by going to the Genealogical Society is uh, was a... Uh, was a neighbor of Grant Wood where he lived. So we're we're on the path. We're trying to find. So that would mean we have one more to find. And if any of you know, please let us know. If you have any so kind this, of clues at all. So uh, I'll, throw, I'll throw another name into the mix here. Uh, oh, Barbara. good. Um, I loved your presentation and I learned lots of things that I never knew before. Oh, but uh, I found in the Cedar Rapids Gazette of June, 1928, and they talked about a man named Harry C. Robinson. Right. What, was he ever used or was that just yes. speculation? He's, he's the one that Grant that um, Nan Wood Graham mentions. And um, and that's where they got that from in the article. I was hoping you were going to come up with somebody we hadn't heard of. Um, <laughs> but um, he is he is the one I was referring to as Grant Wood's neighbor. Um, there was a Harry Robinson that we found at first who was a World War I veteran, but he was from another town and didn't seem to have the connection. This person is named technically Harlow, but we're thinking we'll make the jump. And we found some pictures and they do look a lot like that soldier, so. Yeah. yeah. Well, this thank, is so thank. exciting that yeah. you have new, kind of new scholarship, new, new research to add to this because, you know, the speculation can end in some ways, right? Yes. Uh, well, right, right. We want to keep. We do want to keep talking. You know, we have no. Uh, we have no proof exactly, but boy, when he's drawing somebody, it's all. It's usually pretty obvious that that's the person he was drawing. So, Jean, um, you have a question, and then somebody also asked about the trim. So thanks, Elaine. Um, Terry, when you were talking about the letter, the drawings being stuck in the pipes, I I was confused about. You mean they were actually used, like just stuffed away in 
steam pipes, like as though they were of no consequence or anything? Yeah, Jean, that's how they found them. It's Just unbelievable. Stored above steam pipes, which you can imagine did a number on the paper. And did you so mean? And did you mean they were at the Museum of Art? They, no. when they were okay. found in the steam pipes, the steam pipes were here. I'm at the Veterans Memorial Building. Oh, right now. okay. That's what I. That's where yeah. I got confused. Okay. Thank you. Wow, that's and, amazing. <laughs> and Deb, and Debbie, did you have something? I, I'm, we're getting close to eight, so I want to yeah. get everybody's stuff in there. No, it, just a quick uh, bit of trivia. Uh, Barbara was showing Daughters of Revolution. Um, painting with the teacup and the brooch and Nan had given me a scrapbook in the 70s on her observations of celebrities and meeting celebrities and she went to the home of Edward G. Robinson and met Mrs. Robinson and had tea with them and in her scrapbook she mentioned and I told this to Barb Feller uh, she gave the teacup and the brooch to Mrs. Robinson, Ooh. and God only knows what happened to those two items. I would love to know because the Robinsons, I think it was sold to a shipping magnate, uh, Stavros Niarchos, and but it's at a museum now. But I just, I just thought that was interesting about the about the, the cup and the and the brooch that Nan had given them away. <laughs> They are in the Cincinnati Museum. And as I told Debbie when I was talking to her, I have a student who is related to Edward G. Robinson. I'm going to have to track him down and track down so, his family. So the painting, is at, the painting is at the yes. Cincinnati Art Museum? Right, okay. right. You right. ought to ask that relative. Does That's he know where the teacup do. is? <laughs> right. right. I'm almost positive that that brooch is in the Figgy Art Museum. Well. 99% sure. Oh, good. Maybe that was like an ingredient. I can find out. I can find out. Yeah. yeah. And the teacup too. Yeah, I'll ask them. Um, that is another question. Does anyone know if Grant Wood was drafted or did he volunteer? And, and did he ever leave Iowa during his short term of service before the war ended? Terry, I'll let you do that one. Okay. From his draft card, it appears he volunteered. He wasn't drafted, but it was his military service card. And the only place I can tell he went, because we can do research now on his company, division, battalion, regiment, was that he went to Washington, D.C. for that one month. And that was his service. Great. Thank you. Um, and I, I see there's a question about the medals um, on the, or the edging. And uh, that was one of the major delays. That was one of the last delays was that uh, he was trying to do that edging. And it was, uh, it turned out that it was absolutely the wrong size once they saw it put together. And they actually had to take it apart and start all over again, even though they didn't want to. And Terry, do you want to tell a little bit about what those pieces are that we're seeing on the edges of the windows? Yeah, I'd love to. If you can think of the image, Barbara, I don't know if you can... Go back it, to it. Yeah, even the reflection image. Okay. Um, while she does that, I'll explain that around the horseshoe, if you will, of the finished glass. There you go. That's a good one. Ooh, it's hard. It's hard to see because this thing is so massive. But around that horseshoe, starting on the lower left side is insignia of the Navy. It's their branch insignia and division insignia. And it goes all the way up to the keystone piece above the Lady of Peace head. And then it starts the army. Army insignia, divisions down to, oh, you can, you can see it, that red cross. Does I everyone can, see that? Um, let me, let me, um... Oh, I thought I could go back to with a bigger picture for them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if you so if you track up 
the keystone piece right above Lady of Peace's head and then down to the right. Can you circle the red cross? Is that it? No, nope, keep going. Oh, we're right here. there. Okay. That is an army insignia. And after the red cross, it begins the United States Marine Corps branch insignia. Thank you. That has a lot of meaning and symbolism for our veterans who can come in and see their insignia. Although the Air Force isn't there um, because it wasn't its own branch until World War II, after World War II, when it, the United States Air Force got its own in, during the Korean conflict, Korean War, excuse me. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, I know this has just got more, more than even imagined that was even possible. <laughs> There's a lot of information. <laughs> yes, no, no wonder there's a whole book in it. Oh my God. <laughs> so um, one thing I do want to just take a quick um, uh, count. If, if there's anybody who knows for sure they would like to participate in our reading session. Uh, and of course, we want all, all of you back, you observers, to give feedback and be intrigued by what people say or how what they do. Um, if you could put... Mention it in the chat or just shout out at me now if you like, if you know that you're going to participate and, and read read something next session. Um, I'm just kind of trying to get a feel for that. And you can decide at the very last minute too, you know. And, and please remind, Go ahead. sorry to interrupt you, but just um, we do not have a session next week. So this right. session that Elaine is talking about is on the 28th. It's the 28th. So you have... You have until 6.30 on Monday, the 28th, if you <laughs> get a wild, get you, you know, get a wild hair and, you know, it's it's Sunday and you're like, oh, I can do that. So anyway, so just, uh, and feel free to um, uh, email me too. I don't have to know. We can play it fast and loose and I'll have some things in my back pocket for that session too of, uh of things that, you know, various writers have been inspired to write related to Grant Wood too. So, um, and some resources and things we can roll around in. So I, oh, here we go. Some some folks are, are okay. Yep, it was another great session. So. No, oh, um, thanks everyone for listening and. Thank you. Very it was hard. a blast to put together. It was. We had a lot of fun. If you have follow-up questions about the window, I'm always here. Literally, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's there so, right now. And I'm very, I'm very easily approachable. So just shoot me an email or even give me a call anytime. Okay. Well, you, everybody will definitely want to be back on the 28th because we already have have a a, a number of of people queued up. So that's exciting. And what I want to be able to say about that is you can read, you can share screen if you want and have your content on the screen while you read. You can have somebody read for you. You can do something video if you want to put something together in a video context, kind of like we saw Joe, how we uh, did Joe's uh, great video a uh, couple sessions ago. Um, if you've got a wild hair to be multimedia like that, you can do that because we actually uh, are going to have a couple things like that, I think, for the next session uh, to look forward to. Um, so if you want, yeah, just the expanse of it, you know, we're going to roll around and enjoy ourselves. So um, don't be, don't be shy. This is this is the space for exploration. Gene, you can't be in Tucson at the next session. <laughs> no, no, no. no. I, I don't want to miss it. I would really love it. So I'm going to try to jump on. We'll see how the evening goes there. But well, look, anyway. look at this. Okay, we've got we've got people hopping on. So that we we've got things happening. So that's awesome. Yep. 
Thank you so much, Barb and Terry. That was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sure. Terry, and thank so you, welcome. Debbie, and thank you all. Um, we really appreciate your your attention and your enthusiasm. Thank you. Uh, watch the emails for your reminders. Um, check YouTube channel for for I know Meredith will get some things posted on the YouTube channel in the next week or so, and. Um, we're just chugging right along. Delight right along and happy Valentine's Day. Yes, everyone. Take care. All right.